Welcome to week 12. I'm glad you joined us. Thank you for being with us. We are finishing up the Beatitudes today. We've been working through these for several weeks, and today we're going to look at blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom. And the question we're going to ask and explore is, why does Jesus bookend the Beatitudes with theirs is the kingdom? And everything in between is, this is what life in the kingdom looks like. But the first beatitude and the last beatitude are blessed are those where theirs is, is the kingdom. Grace and peace to you. I'm glad that you're with us. This is going to be really interesting. And I want to just throw this question out. You see, the very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, where theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then that's Matthew 5, 3. Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. And everything in between is a shall be, a will be. This is what life in the kingdom looks like, Jesus is saying. But he bookends these with this is. And is carries with it this connotation of immediacy, doesn't it? Now, in the moment, in the present, is the kingdom of heaven. What is he doing? And are those two related? Attached to the email that I'm sending out to so many of you, I've got a little clip from Officer and a Gentleman. And it's the clip where Richard Gere, who is a recruit trying to be a naval aviator, and Lewis Gossett Jr. is his drill sergeant who's trying to run all of them out, to making it as hard as they can to possibly get through. And of course, Richard Gere's character is a, is a shyster, and he's already been caught making money off of shining belts and, and uh, excuse me, uh, belt buckles and boots for his fellow recruits. And he's in a lot of trouble. And Lewis Gossett's trying to run him off. So he puts him through this uh, 24 hour drill where it's all kind of agonizing physical challenges. He's spraying him at one point with a hose while he runs up and down, holding a, a rifle over his head. It's just excruciating. And at the end, and that's the clip that, and I encourage you to look at it. And if you don't have if you don't have it accompanying this YouTube, then just, just Google Officer and a Gentleman, I Got Nowhere to Go. And it'll pop up. It's a minute and 10 seconds. And Lewis Gossett Jr. is, is saying, I want you to quit. I want you to quit. I want you to quit. D-O-R, drop on request. Quit, quit, quit. And the Richard, Richard Gere character says, I won't, I won't, I won't. Stay. And, and, Lewis, and the drill sergeant just keeps going at him, keeps going at him. And finally, Richard Gere cries out in utter agony. I got no place to go. I got no place to go. I got no place else to go. He cries out in agony, tears coming out of his eyes, his face so contorted. You got to look at the clip. And I asked the men this week, how does that relate to these two beatitudes that we're comparing today? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are you and your persecutor, for yours, theirs is the kingdom. Well, let me start by saying today we will not focus on persecuted for righteousness. We will instead lump in anytime you are upside down, anytime life has come against you, anytime you are, you are stretched out money-wise, health-wise, marriage-wise, whatever it is, family-wise, things are upside down. You are under it. You are in it. It is. You are in a ditch, and life is horrible right now. Now, this could apply to any anything along the spectrum where things are just bad, all the way down to they are really, really bad. So instead of saying "blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness," let's just say "blessed are those who are in the ditch of life with no hope." theirs is the kingdom. Why does he say that? And why does this clip, why, is it, why do I think it represents both of those? Well, if you recall, and if you go back to one of our, one of our first two or three videos, YouTube videos on the Beatitudes, we said that when what Jesus is saying, when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, is you're blessed when you recognize your spiritual poverty. You're, re you're blessed when you recognize that I got nothing. I bring nothing to the table. I, without, excuse the vernacular, but without you, Jesus, I'm screwed. 
my life may look good to other people, but inside my heart, I know that it is empty and upside down and I have screwed things up and I need you. I need a savior. We call that desperate and surrender because when you're desperate and only when you're desperate, will you surrender to Jesus? And, and that is your entry into the kingdom of heaven. Now, living in the kingdom now. There's is when you recognize your spiritual poverty. And let me just take from the clip. When you recognize I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere else to go. So then let's come down to this last beatitude. Blessed are you when you're in the ditch. So that then, that is the kingdom of heaven. Let me start by reading a couple of quotations on our handout, which is attached to you. A healthy, this is a Confucius saying, and it's very good. A healthy man wants a thousand things. A sick man, only one. A healthy man wants a thousand things. A sick man, only one. He just wants to get well. A healthy man has a thousand wants, a thousand wishes. A sick man who knows he's sick has only one wish. I want to get well. Then a quotation from a man, and, and I read it somewhere and I can't pull it up, but it was a man who had seen his entire family butchered in front of him, maybe in Rwanda, maybe somewhere in Africa, wherever it was, maybe down in South America, but his whole family had been butchered. And he was a follower of Jesus. And he said, I never knew Jesus was all I need until he was all I had. I never knew Jesus was all I need until, I, until he was all I had. The Richard Gere character has, has only one wish. He's got nowhere else to go. When we get to the point where we know Jesus is all we need, that is the fullest expression of living in the kingdom now. There's nothing else in the way. There's nothing distorting it. There's nothing uh, watering it down, your relationship with Jesus. There's nothing making it lukewarm or getting you distracted. He's it. And that typically only happens when you're in tough places in life. And if you have talked to someone who's been in that really, really, really hard place, I've been there. And I can look back on it and say with, with a real bittersweet memory, because what I would say and what you've heard other people say, I, I would never want to go through that again. But I've never been so close to Jesus. Because when he was all I had, I realized he's all I needed. And when times got better, it's not that I walked away from Jesus. No, I just couldn't cling to him as tightly as I was clinging to him when he was all I had. When you're upside down and, and you can see, you got nothing. You got nothing. Everything's against you. You have no control over anything. And you can see that Jesus is the only way out. You learn to realize he's all you need. And that is life in the kingdom of heaven. And that's why I think these two join together. The first one is how you enter the kingdom when you're desperate and you surrender. And then this last one is how you live in the fullest expression of the kingdom when there's nothing in the way of your relationship with Jesus. So today, what I want to do is I want to just tease out a little bit this idea of he's all I need. He's all I need. And then I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about what your heavenly father who loves you perfectly is doing and wants to do in your life when he either allows these difficult trials, challenging trials, terrible trials into your life, or, or he just, he, he, may, he may perhaps have placed them there. Why would a loving Heavenly Father do that? Well, the bottom line would be he wants you to get to the point where you realize Jesus is all you need because that, as we say, is the fullest of kingdom living, the fullest expression of living in the kingdom. And when you can get there and stay there or at least stay close to that, you're living life in the kingdom. So when we look at this, we look at this last beatitude, and let me just make a side note. There is, in verse 11, there's one more, blessed are, are you when you are persecuted because of me. But I'm lumping that into the very next few verses where he talks about being salt and light. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that in the, fir in the first week in January. 
Next week, by the way, we're going to read the Christmas story in chronological order. And then we're going to look to see the, 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 the evidence of the Beatitudes in the different characters within the Christmas story. That's next week. Be sure you tune in. But this week, I want to take the time to look at this is and why Jesus bookends this. So the real question is, how do we get to the point, to the place where Jesus is all we need and we know it? And therefore, nothing can rattle us or it cannot rattle us, rattle us for very long or it cannot rattle us for any, with any degree of, of success. We're almost bulletproof because we know he's all I need. Now, yes, I have other things that I want and I enjoy and I've got nice things in my life and I, I don't want to give those up. I don't want to lose those. But if I think I got to have them, if I think I need them to have joy in my heart, then I'm off track and I'm not living the fullness of the expression of the kingdom. Now, I have other things that are distorting that, that are distracting me from that. Other idols. And how a good test to know whether or not you've got these things in your life, and you do, let's just go ahead and say that and just admit that you do, is the degree of anxiety that you feel when something threatens those. You know, I, I, Jesus is all I need. But I live in a nice house, and we have a nice house in Charleston, and I drive a nice car, and life is fairly comfortable right now. If any of those things are threatened or they go away, for what, whatever reason, or my health is really good right now. And everyone I love, their health is really good right now. But if that's threatened, how quickly can I come back to the fact that Jesus is really all I need to have that joy? I like those things. I enjoy those things, but I don't have to have them to have the joy of Jesus in my life. That's the real key. So on the last night, that Jesus is with his disciples, he tells them that they're going to desert him, that they will run away and leave him. And Peter stands up and says, not me. If everybody else leaves, I'm the strongest, I'm the brightest, I'm the best. I'm your man, I'm your right-hand man, I'm your protector. If everybody else leaves, I won't. I'll stand by your side. And Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And I'm going to let him. And I'm going to pray that when you go through this ordeal, you'll come out on the other side and you will be able to strengthen your brother. See, Simon, Jesus was not all Simon needed. Simon needed his pride. He needed his, his uh, performance. He needed his can do, I will conquer. He, he thrived on that. And Jesus knew, and his loving Heavenly Father knew, that he would never be able to lead the new church, the new family of followers if he was relying on his own strength. So he says, Satan has asked to be able to sift you like wheat, and I'm going to let him. Sifting out. We have a saying at 721, sifting, excuse me, suffering sifts the dross of self. Suffering sifts the dross of self. You imagine a sieve sifting out the things that you either don't want or you want, separating, Suffering sifts the dross of self, dross, deleterious materials, things you don't want, you know, refining, things that need to be burned off. For most of us, that's the only way to get them off. We can do some self-sifting, and if we will do some self-sifting, then we'll lessen the need for our loving Heavenly Father to, to allow Satan or anyone else to sift us. So, you know, the first question we ask is, do you have anyone or anything in your life that you wish were not there? Do you have anyone or anything in your life, any situation in your life that you wish were not there? And most of you would say yes. The second question is, do you have anything in your life that should not be there? And if you do, start doing some self-sifting because your Heavenly Father who loves you perfectly will come in and allow you to be sifted so that those things go out of your life. But if you've got something in your life that you wish, something or someone that you wish were not there, we're going to talk in the second part of this about how you approach that, how you take that situation and use it to get closer to Jesus. How do we get to the point where he's all I need? 
I just, I want you to think for a moment about what it looks like to really live in the kingdom, the words that would come to mind, the images that would come to mind. Well, certainly peace and love and joy, and patience, all the fruit of the spirit come to mind, contentment, patience, not being rattled, not carrying any resentment, having a pure heart, really living with, through the Beatitudes. And so then the question is, what in your life is getting in the way of that? What is blocking you from that? What is destroying? What is watering down? What is, what is in the way of Jesus being all you need? Because what you want to do is do a self-analysis and then self-sift. Some things need to be eliminated from your life. Other things just need to slide back to 10th place and let Jesus be one through 10 and let those fall back below that. So you think about what's in your life. You know, it, it's an interesting thought. It could be your church attendance or coming to 721 Ministries or anything like that that's getting in the way of Jesus being all you need because you've got church and you've got your attendance and you've got your performance, your checklist that gives you a sense of security. And so Jesus isn't all you need because you got these other things that give you a sense that you're okay with God. Look at your life. It's whatever is in there that is that is competing with Jesus being all you need is a bad trade. It's a bad trade. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep so that he will, so that he cannot, he will not lose what he, now I'm butchering that up on it right here on live on the video. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. How about that? Pull that off. So what is it? that you're willing to give up for what you cannot lose, to gain what you cannot lose. So what is the fullest expression of living in the kingdom is when everybody, everything else has been moved out of the way and Jesus is all you need. That's the first and most important thing I want to talk about. But I do also want to talk about what do we do? How do we approach? Why would a loving Heavenly Father allow these things into our lives? Well, about... Five years ago, I gave up lifting weights, any sort of resistance training, because my joints were just hurting. My shoulders were hurting, my knees and my, everything hurt, my elbows. I just couldn't do it anymore. But I knew as I was getting into my 60s that my muscle mass was deteriorating. It's just a natural function of getting older. And that I needed to be doing some type of weightlifting, some type of resistance training. So I was, I was fortunate enough to be hooked up with a personal trainer here in town who's just fantastic. He, he specializes in broken down athletes and, and being able to reintroduce that strength training without hurting your joints. So I, I took my own weights when I went on in to see him first time. I said, I'm ready. I want to get stronger. And so I brought in Dina's three pound weights and I started lifting them. And I said, yes, I'm going to get stronger with these. I'm, I'm 196 pounds. I'm a little over six foot and I'm using these three pounds. Am I going to get stronger that way? Three pound weights. That's not going to help me. I need more resistance to strengthen my faith, my trust, my relationship with my Heavenly Father. So the first thing I, I, I say and I realize is my Heavenly Father is going to give me resistance in my life because he wants to grow me. He wants me to get closer to him. He wants to eliminate the stuff, the clutter that's in the way. On the last night when Jesus was with his disciples, John 17, 3, he says, this is eternal life. This is living in the kingdom now that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ is Lord. That is eternal life now, that they may know you. Paul comes along, and in Philippians 3, verse 7 through 10, he says, I want to know Christ. See, he knows that Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, know you. And Paul says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. That's the Holy Spirit living. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. I want to share in the fellowship of his suffering. Because I know that's how I'm going to get to know him. Because suffering sifts the dross of self. And self and everything that accompanies it is what is getting in the way of Jesus being all you need. And therefore, you living and experiencing the fullness of the kingdom now. Job. 
if you try to read Job, you probably get bogged down in about the middle of it. There's about 40 chapters that are just navel gazing. I've never enjoyed reading them, but you get to the end and Job makes this statement, Job 42, five, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. My ears had heard, have heard of you. I thought I knew you, but now that everything's been stripped away, now I can see you. Now I know who you are. Now I know. But I had all these other good things had to be stripped away for me to know who you are. Sometime I want you to pull out Hebrews and read Hebrews 1 through 11, where the Holy Spirit through the writer of Hebrews is talking to, telling us about our Heavenly Father disciplining us, allowing discipline into our lives. And why? And so I'll just pull out a couple of verses. Hebrews 12, 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. If you're not disciplined, the Holy Spirit goes on to say, then you're not a true child. Verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. No one's sugarcoating it. It's not fun, but it's, and it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been, listen to what it says, for those who have been trained by it. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. No longer, we're not using three pound weights anymore. We're getting the heavy stuff. We want to be trained. We want that harvest of righteousness. We want to know him. We want all this other clutter out of the way. And sometimes the only way it'll, it'll go out of the way is when our Heavenly Father sifts us, allows these trials into our life. We have several statements that we see in, in, uh, in Scripture. That we could, I could give you many of them. Uh, here's one from James, Jesus's half-brother. Peter says the, almost precisely the same thing. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. If you recognize that your heavenly father is treating you as a son or a daughter, and that he's seeking to strengthen you and get you, bring you closer to him, then it's almost like those military folks or the, or, or the folks that work out really hard or would say, thank you, sir. May I have another? Thank you, sir. May I have another? Whatever it takes. I want to get closer to you. I want to get stronger in my trust. I want to go deeper. Whatever it takes. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of, of many kinds, because you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Suffering, trials, disciplines, difficult times, they produce perseverance, they produce endurance, they produce trust. And that brings you to the point of being mature and complete. No holes inside. All the holes filled up. Now, there's another reason why your Heavenly Father may allow difficulties into your life or may allow you to bring those difficulties into your life. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all compassion and the Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials, so that we may comfort others in any trials that they experience with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. When you're in a trial, I want you to think about the fact that you're going, you're going to be able to comfort someone else who, who will be ultimately be going through what you're going through. That your Heavenly Father may, be, may have placed you in this for the precise reason that he'll be able to use you in other people's lives. If you're going through a divorce, if you've lost it, let's say you're going through a divorce. Are you going to go to someone whose marriage is perfect? No marriages are perfect. Whose marriage is great? Or are you going to find more comfort with someone who's gone through a divorce, came out on the other end, got to know Jesus better, is thriving in his or her life? Now, who's going to give you more comfort? The one who's already suffered that trauma. If you've lost your job, if you've lost your house, if you've lost your marriage, who are you going to go see for more comfort? You're going to go see someone who has experienced that. So he may just let you through that. Second Corinthians 1, 3, he may be allowing you to go through that just for that purpose. Colossians 1, 24. 
Listen to the Holy Spirit through Paul. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church, the fellowship of his followers. I rejoice because it's running out all those holes. It's filling those holes in my life with Jesus because he's all I need. He's all I got, so he's all I need. And we get to that, that statement that we make in 721, no thanks, I'm full. When you can get to the point where you can say to any temptation or any threat or any fear or any anxiety, anything that's coming at you, no thanks, I'm full. You cannot tempt me with that, no thanks, I'm full. You cannot scare me with that, no thanks, I'm full. I'm full of Jesus because I know he's all I need. Then you can rejoice because you know you're filling up through your suffering. I paraphrase this. Now I will find in now, now, now I will find joy in what I suffer for you because I had a chance to serve you. And this suffering is bringing me closer to Jesus because it is sifting away the dross of self and then filling up all the holes still inside of me with Jesus. Your Heavenly Father is going to, going to allow trials and persecutions and ditches in your life. And he wants to use those to first sift away all the things that are getting in the way of your having a pure relationship with Jesus where he is all you need and that is the fullest expression of life in the kingdom he's also going to do this so that you will grow in your in your faith and your strength and your relationship with him that you'll go deeper that you'll know him better because other things are not getting in the way and you'll get to the point like Peter like Paul like James where you consider it joy he's my heavenly father is not handing me three pound weights he's handing me 50 pound weights He's given me something, some, some resistance that's going to grow me. And that is life in the kingdom. That, my friend, is life in the kingdom. That theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So consider it pure joy. Rejoice. Take the suffering. Take the trials. Take the anxiety. And use it to go deeper and get stronger in your faith. And then you'll have that, that wonderful, bittersweet memory of the trial that you are in, how you wouldn't want to go through it again. No one's looking to be a martyr. But I, I've never been as close as I was to Jesus during that time. And now I want to just do everything I can to stay as close by remembering always he is all I need. Now, one last passage. Another reason why your loving Heavenly Father may allow things in your life. If we go to 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul is talking about a thorn in his side, and he starts this way. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Do any of you have any need to have your Heavenly Father keep you from becoming conceited? And if not conceited, because that's such an ugly word, prideful or relying on self, Anything having to do with you being able to do it in your own power? Is there any chance that any of you may have that going on in your life? Paul realizes, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited or self-sufficient or focused on self or in control or any of those things, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. I can't take it anymore. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My friend, my son, my daughter, my child, my grace is sufficient. My grace, my love, my power. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see, my Heavenly Father is saying to, to me, Sam, I, I know you. And I know that if everything is just perfect in your life, you'll forget about me. Or you'll tend to forget. Or you may drift. Or you'll drift back into the old... It's I, if I don't, it won't. But this to be is up to me that I'm in. I'm now back in control and that these good things in my life, I'm the one that achieved them. I know you, Sam. I'm going to leave that thorn in your side. Because I need and I want you to have to lean on me. I want Jesus to be all you need. Regardless of whatever else I give you in, in this life. 
So then Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak in my own power, then I am incredibly strong in his power. Why would your heavenly father allow these trials sometimes put you into the furnace? Because he wants to sift the dross of self. He wants you to be able to see Jesus is all you need for the joy of life. And then you'll be living in the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom. There's one other passage that we finish up. It's in Isaiah, so Isaiah 30, 20. And it's a really interesting passage. The, the, the terminology is, could be perplexing, but we'll understand and explain why not. Isaiah 30, 20. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden from you no longer. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in the Lord is going to give me the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Bread and water are things that, that I have to have. And the audience in Isaiah's all, in time, and that water and bread were never guaranteed. The bread of adversity and the water of affliction, things we have to have to survive, to grow, sustenance in our lives, the bread of adversity, the water of affliction. What are they going to do? They're going to wipe out everything that hides the Holy Spirit from us, that hides Jesus from us. You won't need your teachers anymore. You'll see with your own eyes, and then you'll be walking step by step with the Holy Spirit because everything else is out of the way, and you'll hear that voice constantly saying, this is the way, walk in it. My friend, if we can understand how to look at trials and tribulations, at at things that, that upset us, things that turn us upside down. If we can learn to look at them as an opportunity to grow in our relationship with our Heavenly Father and our relationship with Jesus, and if we can learn that if we are stripped away, then it's the greatest thing that could ever happen to us because then we know Jesus is all I need. And all these other things, they're just icing on the cake. But Jesus is the cake. Grace and peace be with you, my friends. Thank you for joining us.